we're going to continue with our look into uh, stochastic processes and some of the models that are used in stochastic processes and um, come up with, I think, some very interesting insights, which will give you further understanding of stochastic processes and noise if you work with stochastic processes and noise, which I assume most of you do. I think it's hard to touch a area in engineering, especially electrical engineering, that doesn't have some stochastic processes in it some fashion. So let me uh, go ahead and set up my screen here and uh, go ahead and share my screen. And we ended up last time with this, uh, the concept of Poisson processes. And the Poisson processes were such that uh, uh, these are random points on the line, which are totally characterized by a single number, and that's lambda. Lambda is the average number of occurrences per second or per time interval, per unit time, if you will. And uh, we, we had some Dirac deltas before. That was in the previous slides. We had a bunch of Dirac deltas here. And these Dirac delta points were, Dirac deltas were placed at Poisson points. And we said that we could simulate something called shot noise by running these Dirac deltas through an impulse response H of T, which gives us back V of T. And if you're familiar with convolution, what happens everywhere there's an impulse, you're going to get a replication of H of T like is illustrated here. And uh, you add those up. I tried to add those up graphically using the little red dashed dots here because they are going to add up, of course. But this is a phenomenon known as shot noise. And shot noise is the noise that one gets, for example, from photon counters and um, random arrivals in such physical physics um, experimentation. Okay, so that's the idea of shot noise. I think probably the most general look at Poisson processes is through the following situation. If you have, if you have Poisson processes, a Poisson process, which is total, totally characterized by lambda, lambda is the average number of occurrences per second. And we talked about this before. If you had popcorn, it'd be pop, 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 pop. That'd be a pretty, pretty large lambda. I'm sure with shot noise, it's really, really high. Uh, if you watch cars going by on University Avenues, you would go car, 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 car. And it would be a relatively low lambda corresponding to occurrences per second. But if you have a lambda and you want to ask yourself, what is the, what is the probability of K occurrences in some interval, in, uh, in some interval, um, uh, capital T, that's a, that's a Poisson random variable. It's e to the minus lambda t times lambda t to the k over k factorial. Whoops, that should be a capital T over k factorial. So that's the probability that there are k events in, in, in the interval uh, capital T. Probability that there are k events in the interval t. So, <coughs> excuse me, if you, if you change the value of K, you're going to change the value of, um, you're, I'm sorry, if you change the value of K, you're gonna change this probability. If you change the interval that you're looking at, you're gonna change the probability also. But the lambda is a constant and it's very powerful for computing the probability of any occurrence within the interval, um, within the interval capital T. A uh, Wiener trial, a, a Wiener process is a, this is a different topic now that we're talking about. A Wiener process is a process which is incredibly important, important all the way from Brownian motion all the way to finance and has a number of uh, applications. We assume a bipolar Bernoulli uh, sum process. So therefore you get a Bernoulli sum process. you get a Bernoulli sum process. And so the Bernoulli sum process goes one, then it goes minus one, then it goes minus, whoop, minus one, then it goes minus one, then maybe minus one again, plus one, plus one, minus one, plus one, uh, and, 
and so you get you, you get sequences which look like this. Now, uh, let's just assume that it goes uh, up and down with a value of one here. Well, actually, no, let's not do that because we're assuming here it, it jumps up down it, it jumps up and down with a uh, a value of h, and we're going to take delta as equal to the interval the time interval uh, which we look at. It turns out you can show that the expected value is zero. That makes sense because you go out here and the chances that you jumped up n times are about the same as you jump down n times. And so the average is gonna be zero. But I think you can see as we add these up, what happens to the variance? The variance is gonna get bigger or the standard deviation, let's say, and bigger, and it's gonna get bigger because you get more and more jumps as we, uh, as we go out here with respect to time. And uh, we can be very formal about this. And if we look at time is equal to n times delta, then we can show that the variance is equal to alpha t. Now, this comes from the central limit theorem. Don't forget, these are plus and minus one jumps, aren't they? They're plus and minus one jumps. And what happens if you add up 100 or 1,000 plus or minus one jumps, you invoke the, the central limit theorem, and you're going to get a Gaussian. In fact, these, these random variables out here, this random variable is going to be a Gaussian really, really quickly. After maybe 10 or 12 jumps, it's going to be very, very close to a Gaussian random variable. And we know, according to the central limit theorem, that asymptotically, it does approach a Gaussian as time increases. And so by the central limit theorem, x of t is Gaussian with zero mean and a variance equal to alpha t, where alpha is a parameter which is determined by this result. This is h, h squared and delta. And we're going to kind of like in the Poisson process, we're gonna say h, h is the height and the delta is, is the jump. We're gonna let the height uh, go to zero and delta go to zero such that alpha is equal to h squared over, over delta is equal to a constant. And that's where, that's where the alpha comes from. But the important thing to remember is not specifically the alpha, but that the, the variance increases with respect to time. The variance increases with respect to time. Now, notice here we used a Bernoulli process, a bipolar Bernoulli process, plus or minus one. We could have started with any random process, zero mean random process, and we could have probably done the same sort of mathematics. So any zero mean process that has a finite mean and a finite variance, if you will, because again, we want to impose the central limit theorem and get a Gaussian, but you could probably use any sort of random variable. For example, we could have used, instead of the bipolar, we could have used the Laplace random variable. Remember, that's the double-sided exponential. We could have used that, and every jump was one of these uh, Laplace sort of random variables. So this is what kind of some uh, Wiener processes look like. You'll notice uh, here in the beginning, by the way, this is named after Norbert Wiener. You'll notice here in the, be the beginning, things aren't spread out very much, are they? So sigma is very, very small. But as we go out further and further, the spread of the Wiener process gets larger and larger and larger, doesn't it? And so the, the variance of x of t is equal to this parameter alpha times t. So this standard deviation out here is equal to the square root of alpha t. That's what the variance is equal to. So this is a process where you have repeated occurrences and you, you accumulate them in a sum process. That's what we're doing. We're summing bipolar uh, random variables and you get these different instantiations. And I could have run more, they all kind of look like this, they bounce up and down. So this again has to do with, say for example, Brownian motion, where you put a little itty bitty piece of paper in water and you watch it bounce around a little bit as the molecules hit it. It's clearly a two dimensional generalization of it, isn't it? Because as the molecules hit the, um, uh, hit the little piece of paper is going to bounce around randomly. And so you have a two-dimensional, if you will, random walk. We're just considering the one-dimensional in this case. Another place that it's used uh, quite extensively is in finance, uh, because here is the idea in finance. Let's, uh, let's first of all look at savings accounts. 
if you have a savings account and you have in your savings account S, this is the amount you have in savings account, and you have a mu, which is, I put in here inflationary force. That would be the example, for example, in a stock. But if you put it in a, um, in a savings account, you could look at mu as the interest rate. What interest rate are you getting in the account? Now, the more money you have in, the more the, the 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 greater the amount your security is going to grow, right? It's going to be bigger. So we're going to call we're going to call a, the following equation. This is something called continuous time, um, continuous time uh, finance. But in continuous time finance, the little bit of money that you make in a small interval, we're assuming we're compounding, if you will, almost instantaneously. The point is, it's going to be proportional to how much you have in the bank account, right? It's going to be proportional to how much you have in the bank account. So this gives a very nice uh, differential equation. ds dt is equal to mu s. And this, we all know as engineers can be solved and it is an exponential growth. And we all know that indeed we have, if, if we put a amount in the bank, and it's safe and it's interest bearing that it is going to go up exponentially and it's going to depend upon your interest rate mu. Now this again is, is assuming an instantaneous, um, instantaneous interest rate, if you will. Typically, if you put money in the bank, your interest is compounded monthly. I think you probably get a new amount every month. So you get into discrete mathematics, but it's just about the same. So let's talk about uh, this applied to the stock market. In the stock market, you have a volatility. You hear, if you listen to business sort of uh, programs where they analyze stock, they talk about a stock's volatility. If, if a stock is really volatile, the price is really going up and down, right? If a stock is not, not volatile, it kind of is going like this. So, so the movement of the stock corresponds to the sigma. Here you have a big sigma because the data is spread out. Here you have an itty bitty sigma because you have a low volatility and not much is happening. So for this, it turns out that the above differential equation is uh, modeled as the amount of money you make is proportional to, here we have an inflationary force, if you will. In other words, money uh, loses its value over time. So mu is an inflationary source. And so it's equal to mu times S of T times DT. And then uh, it's also going to be equal to sigma, which is your volatility times your stash. If you have a lot of volatility, you're going to lose a lot of, if you get a lot of negative volat. I'm sorry. If, uh, if the, if the market moves a lot south, into the negative area, you're going to lose a lot of money. If it goes north, you're going to lose, you're going to gain a lot of money. And the amount of money that you make is proportional to how much money you have involved in the stock market. And then here, instead of a DT, we have a DVDT. And the DVDT is um, nothing more than the derivative of a Wiener process. You look at that and you say, what the heck does that mean? You know what it means? It just means it's it's a plus or minus one. Because that's the derivative of that Wiener process, right? In other words, it's going to change either plus or minus one. And uh, that's the uh, that, that's the model that the people in finance, at least in, in academia, use, is that you have a Wiener process and the value of your stock tomorrow is equal to the price of your stock today. In fact, if you had no inflationary, if you had no inflationary models, uh, the value tomorrow is equal to sigma S times DVT, which means that your price tomorrow, your expected value of your price tomorrow is gonna be the same as your expected price today, uh, except that there is this coin flip here. That's what this DVDT says. This DV, DV is the derivative of the Wiener process. And it says, well, you know, the chances it goes up are the same as it goes down. And this turns out to be, um, this whole thing turns out to be a differential equation, which is fundamental to finance. 
there's an entire book. I believe it's written by a guy named Hall. It's called uh, Derivatives and um, uh, it, it has it has the word um, derivatives in it, but it derives things like fair pricing for futures. It has the Black-Scholes equation in it, which tells you how what, what is a fair price to charge for a for an option. Uh, won the Nobel Prize, I think I mentioned before, and all of these different uh, different models. But these all of these models are based upon this differential equation. It's a very often used differential equation in finance. So you'll see this a lot in, in uh, finance as they analyze different things in the movement of the market. Now, I should mention that a lot of traders don't believe in this. They believe that they can do things like trend lines and look at the, look at the tick data and figure out where the stock is going. But there is, there's literally a conflict there between people in academia and a lot of traders who believe you can do do things with uh, tick data. This assumes you can't do anything with tick data. Everything is a crapshoot. Now, what you want to do if you want to get rich is you don't follow this. You th this, this is the price of the market if you know nothing about the market. If you know nothing about a stock, only the volatility and the inflationary force, this is the best model you can use. But if you're people like Warren Buffett, you go study the, you go study the, uh, uh, study the security, you find out the management behind it, you find out all sorts of things, and that lets you figure out how to invest in things. And this is no longer applicable as a stochastic process because you know more about what's going on. Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, let's let's shift gears a little bit. And let's talk about a specific type of stochastic process here. No questions so far, huh? No, but I thought it was interesting. And oh, the Wiener process, yeah, yeah. You know, um, the financial implications. You know, the um, I, I was involved in a conference, I think it's still going on, called Cypher, which is Computational Intelligence and Financial Engineering. It was sponsored by the IEEE, and uh, we put on the first three of them. And that's where I learned all about this stuff. Um, and one of the things that you did learn is that the quants, the people that like to look at tick data, believe that you can forecast the market for that. You should read a, a, a story by Gary Smith. He... Uh, he had a friend that was an economist and, and, or a trader, I should say, and enjoyed trading. And he generated some things by total random stochastic process. And he showed the guy this result. And the guy said, this is very interesting. And after he looked at it for a while, he said, what company is this? I think I want to buy it. <laughs> just on total processes because you, you can generate all sorts of patterns by random and uh, fool yourself and fool yourself really, really badly in doing these things. Uh, the guy that, um, that that I work with, Jack Marshall, he was the president of the, uh, what was it? The, I don't know, International, uh, International uh, Institute of Financial Engineers or something like that. He was, um, he, he was the one that told me that uh, he has people come to him all the time. And these people that believe that the tick data determines where the market is going. And he has people come to him all the time and say, hey, Dr. Marshall, I, uh, I really, I think I've cracked the market with a neural network. And he says, I've had so many of these that I've, I've boiled down and I just am asked them one question to determine the validity of their model without even looking at it. And his question is, what kind of car do you drive? The idea, of course, is that if they indeed did have a technique which beat the market with their neural network, they should be riding around on Lam in Lamborghinis. But he finds out, no, this is never the case. And when you reduce it to practice, when you get somebody that uh, takes their neural network and invests in the market, you find out it, it just doesn't work. Now, there are places for artificial intelligence in the market. In fact, one of the first big businesses in neural networks was by a guy named Robert Heck Nielsen. Heck Nielsen founded a 
a company called Heck Nielsen Corporation. And every time that you went and had had your credit card scan at a grocery store for many years, starting, I believe, in the mid 90s, uh, it would go to Heck Nielsen Corporation and he would check your whether or not your transaction was a fraud uh, using neural networks. He eventually sold his company for millions of dollars. Uh, he sold it to a place called Fair Isaac. Uh, how many have heard of Fair Isaac? You haven't, but you have heard of uh, your FICA, your FICA score, haven't you? Uh, the FI and FICA store stands for Fair Isaac. They're the company that owned that uh, process. He, he sold it. Um, I talked to him later later in life and... Uh, after he after he had was a millionaire, he was a private pilot. He was flying all the all around the world. He was a really big guy. Really enjoyed life, and <coughs> he knew was he knew I was a Christian. And he called me up and he says, "Bob, I want you to know I had a heart attack, and I had this heart attack, and I have such a new lease and such a new outlook on life." He knew that all of his accomplishments and everything else didn't mean anything because when you have a heart attack, you face death right, right in the eyeball. And he says, I found out that the, uh, you know, what I was doing before wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, totally, totally good. So I've, I've, I got religion. So he was, he was excited to share that with me. Really interesting guy. Very rich guy too. Very rich guy. I think he sold to Fair Isaac for 43 million sticks in my mind, but I think it might have been bigger than that. He's doing okay. Okay, enough with Robert Heck Nielsen and his selling of his company to Fair Isaac and Heck Nielsen Corporation. I did consulting for Heck Nielsen Corporation in a lawsuit, and one company was suing another one. And that's where I found out very interesting stuff because I was able to look at their code. Yes, I can read code. And one of the things I found out, which is very interesting, and this was this was before hypercomputers, and you can find anything with a computer. Do you know if you subtract zip codes, it gives you a rough estimate of the east to west distance of the locations? If you subtract zip codes, it gives you a rough estimate of the east to the west distance of the location. And I see everybody thinking, okay, I'm here. Who do I know? What zip code do I know east or the west to be? We're in Texas right now. And I think if you find that, if, if, if you go west, you get larger zip codes. If you go east, you're going to get smaller zip codes. So that was one of their, one of their, uh, one of their parameters. And I thought that was very interesting. I don't know who thought of that. But I think that was a very interesting little tidbit that they put into their fraud detection scheme. Okay, any additional, any any other questions or comments? By the way, the people in finance uh, that do true finance, mathematical finance, are very sophisticated mathematically. You want to hear the irony? Nobody gets rich going into finance in academia. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it very, it's very interesting. You as an electrical engineer will probably make more money than somebody with a, uh, with a degree in finance. Okay, let's, uh, let's continue. I'm going to share my screen if I can find the clicker button here to do it. I'm going to try not to belch. As I told you, I've been having my cucumber lunch here. Um, and cucumbers are very interesting from a gastrointestinal point of view. Okay, we're going to talk about a specific type of stochastic process today. And that's the stationary stochastic process, stationary random process, if you will. Now, this is... Um, this is very interesting because you've seen this before. You don't know that you've seen it before, but you have seen it before. And you've seen it before in time invariant systems. What are time invariant systems? Time invariant systems are systems which do not change with respect to time. Suppose that you had a system here. And you wanted to characterize that system with some sort of input and some sort of output. 
okay? If you knew nothing about the system, if you knew nothing about the system, what would you have to do? You would have to catalog all of the outputs for all the inputs in order to totally characterize the system, right? We have that sort of situation with stochastic processes. We have, uh, you know, we have a stochastic process, whatever it is. In order to know the stochastic process, we have to know the first order statistics, the second order statistics. We have to know the tenth order statistics and the millionth order statistics. It's kind of like we need to know everything, just like that system. We would need to know everything. We would need to know the entire set of outputs for the in for the um, for the set of inputs. Now, for systems, one of the things we do is we assume that the system is linear. And with a linear system, you have two processes going for you. You had additivity, which says that the system response uh, to x1 plus x2 is equal to the system response to x1 plus x2. Sorry, I got a little messy here. And then you have the homogeneity property that the system response to um, a constant times X is equal to A times the system response to X. In other words, if you amplify the output, you amplify the input by the same exact amount. So here, you, you can use these processes to say, okay, why... Um, y is equal to the, uh, let me, let me, let's be careful. Y of T is equal to the system response. Now this system only operates on functions of T that's implicit, right? If it's not a function of T, it treats it like a constant. So this is equal to the system response to X of T. Uh, here, what we're going to do is we are going to write this in terms of the sifting property of the Dirac delta function. Hopefully you've seen this before. Right? We've just substituted uh, this Dirac delta expression here for x of t. Is that okay? At this point, it turns out that this system only operates on, well, for, well, before we do that, the integral is like a summation, right? So the system operating on the integral is the same thing as the integral operating on the system. So it's going to be something like this. And uh, that's all well and good, except that now we can apply the fact that the system only responds to functions of time. This is no longer a function of time. So we can factor this outside. In a similar fashion, d tau is not a function of time. So we can factor that outside. We good now? What do we call this? We call this the impulse response, right? That's the response of a system to an impulse. In other words, we have, an, we have an input here, and this input is a function of time. We put a Dirac delta here at some value of t, or a tau. We run it through the system, and we're going to get out some sort of function of t. And so what this is, this is going to be the impulse response. 
So if we put this in value, now it's going to be a function of tau because there's nothing that says that we put in the tau here, it's going to be the a shifted version if we put it in at a different place. But we're going to get something out here. And usually we call this H. Now it's going to be a function of time and it's going to be a function of tau. It's going to be a function of the location of the Dirac delta input. So we can put H T semicolon tau. In, in which case, if we talk about this as the impulse response, then the output is equal to this. There's some people that call this the superposition integral. The superposition integral is applicable to all linear systems. If you have a linear system, you can apply the superposition integral. Now, what's interesting is that if you go from field to field, you find a similar derivation of this same exact math that I've had, except the impulse response. Do you know what they call it in optics? In optics, H is the impulse response. And optics is called the point spread function. In other words, you can, you can look at optics and say, hey, it's linear, so therefore there must be a point spread function. Uh, in electromagnetics, it's called a Green's function. How many of you heard of a, a Green's function? Anybody? Okay, Green's function. Green's function is nothing more than the impulse response. It's another name for it. So a number of fields have independently, independently derived this idea of what happens when you have a linear system and that you can characterize it by this two-dimensional function h of t and tau. The cool part is, if you have a linear system, you can take this two-dimensional function, you can put it in your pocket and you go home and you don't even have to look at the system anymore. You have it totally characterized. Give me any input, I crank this integral and I give you the output. So h of t of tau is something which is, uh, yeah, it's a very powerful concept. But then we also impose the second criteria. Notice we have, we have imposed two criterias. Number one is that it's linear. Now, can anybody tell me what the second criteria we're going to figure out is? Time invariant? Yep, time invariant. What does time invariant mean? Physically, it means that your system is not changing with respect to time. That your system today is the same as your system yesterday. If you play a, um, a downloaded, if you played a streaming movie today, it will be the same as if you stream the movie tomorrow or the day before. It's exactly, it's exactly the same. Uh, at a very fundamental level, if you have a resistor whose resistance cha it doesn't change at all, then that's time invariant. The resistor doesn't change with respect to time. If, on the other hand, you have a resistor whose resistance changes as a function of ambient temperature, then that is going to be a time variant system. It's not going to be time invariant. So the cool thing about time invariant systems is that if we have a impulse we have an impulse right now, and we have a corresponding H of T. If we put that impulse in later, if the system is time invariant, we're going to have the same exact result. We're going to have the same exact result. If we play the record today, we're going to get the record, the sound. If we play the record tomorrow, we're going to get the sound, except it's going to be delayed by a day. So the system is not changing with respect to time. So therefore, H of T, H of T tau, 
it turns out to be only a difference between T and tau. All of the impulses are the same and you can just shift one impulse and that's all you need to do. So you need a single impulse re response and then I'm running out of room here, but then the superposition integral here becomes the convolution integral. Now, we have already seen convolution in some of our work because we found out when we added two random variables, what did we do with their probability density functions? We convolved them. Well, convolution, asking where you use convolution is like asking where you use multiplication. It's manifest in a lot of different places. This is how it's manifest on linear systems theory. And in many times when we talk about so-called LTI systems, this is exactly what we mean It's linear and it's time invariant. And therefore we can talk about the convolution integral. So what does this have to do with stochastic processes? Stochastic processes, let's go up here and let me change color here. Let me go to red because red is really cool. Red is really cool. Um, a stochastic process, which is stationary, means that the process does not change with respect to time. Well, that would be pretty boring, right? Because I think that the only process that doesn't change with time is just a strict DC. But by a stationary stochastic process, it's kind of like saying that it's time invariant. It's time invariant in the sense that the statistics of the stochastic process don't change with respect to time. The statistics of the stochastic process don't change with respect to time. The character does not change with respect to time. So if I do a pop and I do another one, the two are gonna be, woo -woo, but they're not gonna be stationary because there's a transient there which kind of dies out. And if I do 50 of them, and I do an ensemble average, I can figure out the mean uh, the mean at every point, but the mean is gonna change because I do the pop and then after it goes to total silence. So that is not a time invariant system, or time, I'm sorry, that is not a stationary system. It's statistics are changing with respect to time. Places where you uh, have stationary stochastic processes are like in white noise, which you've heard of, which sounds like somebody shushing you all the time. It goes, shh. We'll talk about the specific mathematics behind uh, Gaussian noise, or I'm sorry, behind white noise later. Um, another example is if you have a buzz or hum in your system. That hum is a stochastic process, even though it's maybe in the background of uh, 60 cycles sort of, um, sort of hum. That's another example of a stationary process. So if the process change, doesn't change with respect to time, its statistics don't change with respect to time, then it is a stationary stochastic process. I, um, yeah, I, I, I like to think of it as the character of the stochastic process doesn't change with respect to time. Its character doesn't change with respect to time. So you'll notice the relationship, and the reason we went down this rabbit trail is because the relationship between this and the concept of time invariance. Time invariance lets you get a single H of T, right? The impulse response. And the cool thing about this impulse response is that's one experiment you input with an impulse, you get the output. You can take that single function and you can put it in your pocket and go home and you don't have to look at the system anymore because you know that no matter what input you get, that you just simply take it and you can evolve it with H of T and you get the output, right? And by restricting the model we have reduced the complexity of what we have to deal with. We'll find out something very similar happens with stationarity. Notice also that we have H of, H of T tau here becoming a one, this is a two dimensional function. Once we do time invariance, it is a one dimensional function. We'll find out something similarly happens in stationary processes. And here, I'm going to give you a little 
you, you won't see it right away, but you know how we have an R sub X of T and tau? That's the autocorrelation between two points, T and tau, right? Once we assume stationarity, this assumes that R sub X is only a function of the difference between T and tau. Isn't that interesting? So this is exactly the same thing that happens with time invariance. The two-dimensional function becomes a one-dimensional function. Why is that? Uh, the reason for that is that if we do have a stochastic process and its character doesn't change with respect to time, if we take this and let's say uh, T minus tau is equal to capital T. So this is T and this is T minus tau. The difference between these is some distance, say capital T. Well, if the system is not changing with respect to time and we go over here and we take say the same value, we take the same value, but we keep the relationship, the distance between the two points the same. We keep the distance between the two points the same. The correlation between this point and this point should be equal to the correlation between this point and this point. Why is that? It's because the stochastic process has not changed its character with respect to time. So no matter where you go and you look at two points separated by a value of t, you're going to have exactly the same autocorrelation. So uh, hopefully this has given you a, a, a kind of overview of what stationarity is and its relationship to time invariance and the fact that the math is, has some similarities. And in both cases, we're, we're saying that the, um, that the character uh, for stationary process, we're saying that the statistics don't change with respect to time. In other words, the character doesn't change. And with systems, we're saying that the system doesn't change with respect to time. And in both of these cases, you get this uh, simplification. You get this simplification that the autocorrelation becomes just the difference between the two random variables. And down here is that the impulse response just becomes a difference between the two points in time. So that's kind of cool. So let's get a little bit more into the weeds here. So here we're going to talk about, it's, it's a new deck of PowerPoints, and we're going to talk about stationary stochastic processes, if you will. And for some reason, my, there we go, okay. As we mentioned, a stationary random process or a stationary stochastic process, what's the difference between random and stochastic? It depends if you want to impress your audience enough. If you, if you use the word stochastic, it sounds more, highfalutin than if you use the word random, but they're exactly the same. We've given some examples as white noise, for example, of uh, hum in the background of a signal due to uh, antennas picking up spurious 60 cycle signals. And there's different types of stationarity, and we'll talk about those. We'll talk about the two types. The strict stationarity is very, um, the strict stationary is very specific. It's generally pretty hard to show that a process is um, stationary in the strict sense. There's lots of different uh, criteria here, and we'll go over those criteria. And then we, we also have what is called wide sense stationary. And wide sense stationary is an easy way to talk about stochastic process. And we will see that, for example, that if we have wide sense stationary stochastic processes, that strict sense stochastic, uh, strict sense uh, random processes are a subset of the wide sense stationary. Wide sense stationary, wide means general, sloppy. Uh, we, can, we, we can be much more general and in including of what we want. And then we'll also talk about cyclostationary stochastic processes. Um, and and we'll, let, me, let me wait until we get there. It's, it's a generalization of the idea 
of a stationary stochastic process to periodic processes. For example, if we were to look at the, um, oh, let's see the average temperature over the last month, you know, one day it would be whoop, and the next day it'd be whoop, and the next day it'd be whoop, and all of those days we kind of lined up. But it wouldn't be the same throughout the day, would it? but it would be the same at one o'clock one day as it would one o'clock the next day, as it would the one o'clock the next day. So over a period, if you will, it's, it's kind of stationary and it doesn't change its character from one period to another. The statistics of one period are the same as the statistics of another period. So it's a generalization of the idea of stochastic, or I'm sorry, generalization of the idea of stationary random processes. Okay, here we're going to get into the strict sense. This is, uh, again, very rough. It's very precise, and it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult test to pass. We have a number of points that we have chosen uh, on, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the random variable, if you will. Not the random variable, but the stochastic process, okay? We have chosen some points, um, say, T1, T2 all the way up to TK. Now, we are going to go down. We're gonna go down here and we're gonna go down a distance of tau. So this one is gonna be T1 plus tau. This one's gonna be T2 plus tau. And this one over here is going to be TK plus tau. Now, each one of these points is going to have a corresponding random variable, right? And each one of these points is going to have a cumulative probability density function, depending on where you choose those points at, right? Now, if it is, if it is, a uh, stationary in the strict sense, then if we take all of these points, we move them down here, a value of tau, then the cumulative distribution function of the left part here is exactly equal to the distribution of the right part here. And that has to be true for no matter what values of points you choose and no matter what the value of tau is. I mean, that's a pretty pretty big hefty order to uh, to fulfill. So again, the idea of stationary in the strict sense means the statistics here, statistics as measured by the cumulative distribution function are equal to the statistics here, which are the same points moved a distance tau down the axis. Does that make sense? So you can see here, we're kind of invoking this idea of time invariance of not time invariance, but of stationarity, that the statistics do not change with respect to time. So in other words, as you see here on the bottom, all of the CDFs are independent of the choice of the time origin. That's another way to say it. All IID random processes are strictly stationary. That's kind of cool. What does IID uh, random processes equal to? Uh, coin flips. You flip a coin, you get a heads, you get a one, zero, one, 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 zero, one, 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 zero. And um, it turns out that the correlation, all, all of the all the random variables are exactly the same. Why is that? Because if we take if we take the stochastic process here and we look at its cumulative distribution function, because they are independent they can be written as the product of the product of the one dimensional correspondings. And that's the same as it is down the, down the hall. So if I have a, I have a stochastic process where I'm flipping a coin, right? And I go down here a thousand years, I'm still flipping a coin a thousand years from now. Are not the statistics between these three points the same as the statistics between these three points. Yeah, they're gonna be exactly the same. It kind of makes sense. There's really nothing that changes with respect to 
the character of the stochastic process as time increases. So the cumulative distribution function here, because they're independent, is going to be exactly the distribution of the um, uh, uh, of, this, uh, of the stochastic process delayed a value of tau. So this would be T, say T1, and this would be a T1 plus tau over here. Trying to fill in a little bit of the uh, details here. Okay, uh, the telegraph signal, I'm gonna skip this because I think we didn't get into the telegraph signal very much. So I will, and besides, you don't want me to wade through this math here. Just know that the telegraph signal, which was the ones and zeros according to the Poisson process, is itself uh, stationary in the strict sense if we do the coin flip at the origin. In other words, the flip theorem. Now, let's look at a stationary stochastic process. One thing about a stationary stochastic process is that the mean has to be the same at all times. The mean has to be the same at all times. In other words, if we have a stochastic process right here, and we look at the mean of this, uh, of this point in time, it's going to be exactly the same as the mean at this point in time if it's strictly stationary, right? Because the process isn't changing with respect to time. The mean stays exactly the same for all values of time. So therefore, the expected value of x of t is equal to m, which is equal to a constant. And it doesn't change with respect to time. Many processes, like white noise, can anybody guess what the mean of white noise is going shh? Take a guess. I guess zero. Yeah, it's zero, right? Because it kind of wiggles up and then it wiggles down and wiggles up. And it's kind of like a terrible sinusoid. Yeah, if you had a sinusoid coming out of a wall socket, right? And which if you have random phase, what would be the expected value of that? Turns out to be a stationary, a stationary stochastic process if you randomize the phase. And that would be equal to zero also, right? So many stochastic processes of interest have a zero. Uh, mean. However, more generally, you have a, a, a stationary stochastic process. Its mean is equal to this. Now, the autocorrelation function, another thing that we have decided, and I gave you this in the, uh, in the beginning, that the autocorrelation function is only a function of the difference between the two variables, right? It's only a function of the difference between the two variables. That's how we said that kind of was like time invariance, but this is stationarity. By the way, I should mention that if you deal with stochastic process, this second term is conjugated. We're going to assume all of our stochastic processes are real, however. So this is a criterion for a strictly stationary stochastic process. So here, 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 here's the bottom line. If this is true, and as this is true, can we be sure that the stochastic process is stationary in the strict sense? No, we can't, right? There's a lot more tests that we would have to apply. However, let's get sloppy. And we're going to get sloppy, and we're going to say that if a stochastic process meets this, and a stochastic process meets this criterion, then we are wide sense stationary. We are stationary in the more sloppy sense. It's very clear that you can probably have these criteria for stochastic processes that are not stationary in the strict sense. But this is going to be a more general application. In other words, X of T is wide sense stationary, stationary in a sloppy sense, if you will, if the mean is a constant for all time and the autocovariance or the autocorrelation here is just a function of the difference between the variables. So you can see this is a much looser definition of stochastic process and one that treats uh, us engineers very nicely, as we'll see. But you can see this is true of all, this is true of all processes that are stationary in the strict sense, right? So therefore we do have the idea, the Venn diagram that I did before of wide sense stationary and then stationary in the strict sense. 
So everything the stationary in the strict sense is wide sense stationary, wide, <laughs> wide sense stationary, but the converse is not true. There is one case, and I'll let you guess. There is one case. Let me let me write this down. Strict sense stationary implies wide sense stationary, right? There is one case There is one case where this arrow goes both ways. Does anybody want to guess what kind of stochastic process the arrow goes both ways with? I'll give you a hint. It's due to our good buddy. We've seen again and again and again and again. It turns out if the underlying process, stochastic process, is Gaussian, then wide sense stationarity uh, assures stationary in the strict sense. We'll actually prove this later. But in general, this arrow only goes one way. Uh, in many cases, or in the case of Gaussian noise, you hear it goes the other way. So how many of you have heard the term Gaussian or maybe white Gaussian noise? One of the cool things about Gaussian noise is because of this general process. The Gaussian is always our friend. We've seen it in the central limit theorem, and we see it here. We're going to see it here. Um, so that's really, really interesting. The math becomes very interesting, and the Gaussian has very, very special processes. Okay, let's look at some of the uh, manifestations of this. I'm going to check my time here, okay? Recall the average power. Remember the expected value of the power was equal to the second moment? We were talking about sticking your fingers in the, in the wall socket and what you would feel. What you would feel was be the second moment. Now, uh, in general, R sub X of uh, T tau is equal to this. So therefore, we see that R sub X of TT, and this gives us kind of a physical idea of what's going on. That's equal to the expected value of X squared of T, and that's equal to the power. So the autocorrelation evaluated when both of the, both of the arguments are T is equal to the expected power as a function of time. Now, if the stochastic process is stationary in the wide sense, what is R sub X of T? Well, R sub X of T, T if we have a wide sense stationary stochastic process is equal to R sub X of T minus T, <coughs> which is equal to R sub X of zero. Right? So it turns out with a stationary stochastic process that the, that the instantaneous power here is equal to this, and it's equal to a constant. In fact, we should probably put the expected value of power here because the expected value of x squared t, if we have a stationary process, then the second moment doesn't change with respect to time, does it? The second moment doesn't change with respect to time. So this is a very interesting observation. The autocorrelation at the origin for a wide sense stationary process dictates, dictates the, I can't find my pen here, there we go. The autocorrelation at the origin dictates what the power is going to be. And the power from a stationary process, as you might expect, is constant, right? Stationary, doesn't change with respect to time. So the power of white noise shh, stays exactly the same. The power associated with the stochastic process of your voltage in your wall socket uh, is a stationary stochastic process. And that's a constant too. So the power that you get out of your light socket is equal to a constant. And let's just give an example of this. This is the wall circuit, A times the cosine of omega T plus phi, uh, theta, uh, capital theta. I always thought theta, I think I mentioned it before, the capital theta looks like a fat man, doesn't it? Right? You can come here and put eyes on it. 
looks like a fat man. Okay, eight times cosine omega t plus uh, theta. Theta is your random variable. That's the phase. You probably know what the amplitude is. That's how many volts the socket is. But then what is the uh, expected value of x of t? It's equal to zero. Well, that, that satisfies one of the criteria of why it's sense stationary, right? That the, that the expected value is equal to zero. And this is something that we've worked out before. The autocorrelation is equal to uh, the result here. R sub X of T and tau is equal to A squared over two times the cosine. You can see it here. Notice naturally, beautifully, this turns out to be a function of T minus tau. It's a function of T minus tau, suggesting right away that the autocorrelation function is just a function of T and tau or T minus tau. This just pops up from the math, just assuming that this is true. And it satisfies our intuition that the random phase signal that we get out of a wall socket is going to be a stationary stochastic process, at least in the wide sense. And so the autocorrelation here is equal to a squared over two cosine of omega t. And we have, um, we have that the expected value is equal to this evaluated where? Evaluated at zero. We evaluate the autocorrelation at zero, we get the expected value of the power, and we get this. So it's a squared over two, and this gives us the, I forget what they used to call this in circuits, a over root two. It's the RMS, I think it's the RMS, uh, RMS amplitude of a sinusoid with a varro, with, with, with a peak of one. So that's the reason we, yeah, in fact, I have it down here, right? Okay, I don't even have to use my memory. It's the RMS voltage of a sinusoid. And you all remember that from circuits, uh, hopefully. And uh, now you know one of the places that it comes from and one of the places it can be used. So that concludes what we're going to say to this point about wide sense stationary stochastic processes. Uh, they're very, they're very interesting. One of the things that we're going to show later is the following. Um, have you all heard of the power spectral density or the power spectrum of a random process, right? Guess what? The power spectrum is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation. Fascinating, isn't it? Um, I still have a problem getting my hands around the idea of relating the autocorrelation to the power spectrum. But we will find out that the power spectrum is the Fourier transform of the autocorrelation. So, you've, so hopefully we're getting into a lot of things that you've heard about. Gaussian noise, power spectral density, power spectrum, things of that sort and we're giving them definitive definitions. But just like in a lot of the models of electrical engineering, we're constrained. This idea of a power spectral density and an autocorrelation, one-dimensional autocorrelation, is only under the assumption of stationarity. If you don't have the stationarity, it doesn't work. I would ask in a PhD examining committee, for example, what is the uh, impedance of a diode? A diode has no impedance. Impedances are limited to what? To linear time invariant systems. They're just limited to time invariance. And if you do anything nonlinearity, all of that theory goes out. So that theory is very beautiful in the mileage that, that it gives us analytically and in terms of the way we think, but it also is limited and we must be careful every time we apply it to make sure that the underlying assumptions are applicable. Okay. That concludes uh, the lecture. Any questions before we go?